So I want to take a second look at Bloodborne. I am of course pleased with how the original video turned out, but I think I was missing something in that analysis. But hey, at least no one saw that. Oh shit. I don't regret what I said, so all that I said about Joseph Campbell's myth being inverted, I still think remains true. But I want to do something a little bit different from what I normally talk about. Because video games are a medium that have the unique ability to communicate its ideas and themes directly to the player through its mechanics. As many of you probably know, I think this is a part of the language of the medium that has largely untapped but vast emotions emotional potency, but usually I describe it in a way where it's more complementary to a story than it is fundamental to it. It's an approach that's invalid here, because Bloodborne communicates one of its major themes primarily through the mechanics, and in a way I don't think we've seen before. It's a topic that's not going to have us nearly as focused on Lovecraftian horror, but rather its use of gothic horror that seems to be credited for misdirection, rather than being something that actually has merit. And so that's what I want to look at in this video. First, what gothic horror actually has to offer, and then how Bloodborne uses it in a way that has the player directly experiencing it. And with that, let's now look at how Bloodborne has us engage in one of the most defining gothic horror tropes, and why there's more to it than meets the eye. Just about everyone who's played the game knows that it's divided into two halves. The gothic horror in the first half, and the Lovecraftian horror in the second half. And while that's descriptive, I think the fact it's so widely accepted clutters the conversation because Lovecraftian horror is ultimately an extension of gothic horror. Bloodborne understands this, but before we can talk about what showed up in Bloodborne, we need to talk about what inspired gothic horror in the first place. Gothic horror is notoriously difficult to pin down as it died out and revived multiple times. Some literary critics will make a distinction, but gothic horror is largely accepted as being a part of the romantic movement, and it's hard to talk about romanticism without at least acknowledging that it was a response to neoclassicism and the Enlightenment, which was very focused on mankind becoming and being rational. This was a time when the most powerful ideas were the most logical and objective. It paved the way for what we now recognize as science, but more on this later. For now, what's important to understand about this time in the Enlightenment is human understanding seemed to be widely accepted as the defining feature of our species. These were the ideas that were changing the world. Romantics, however, thought something was missing from this. Romantics wanted to demonstrate a value for what they thought couldn't be articulated. Human emotion. This led to an elevation of this distinct feature of humanity. You make love sound unpleasant. It is all consuming. And when it is reciprocated, it brings the greatest pleasure. One of the emotions they were interested in having their audience experience was fear. This, as you might have guessed, would build the foundation for gothic horror. Coincidentally, gothic horror writers were accompanied by extremely important scientific discoveries that would be incorporated into their stories. This would provide the writers of this time with many of their topics to provoke horror in their audience. After all, this is the genre that would go on to perfect the mad scientist archetype, because it just so happened the discoveries that coincided with gothic horror writers were inducing anxieties across the 18th and 19th century world, and that's what gothic horror writers were tapping into. Early on, Frankenstein would brilliantly and directly demonstrate the lack of boundaries for science by introducing the horrific concept of a man brought back to life that nature already claimed to be dead, an idea well known to be inspired by Mary Shelley's conversation about the new discovery of galvanism and its possibilities. Strange Case of Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde was written not long after the theory of evolution was introduced to the world, and in it, we have a scientist who blurs the line between man and beast because it shows him literally losing control and devolving into a creature that more closely resembles his bestial origins through his breakthrough. The Great God Pan was written in a time when science was able to make surgery painless, as well as operate on the brain, and it tells the story of a quote doctor of transcendental medicine who, in an attempt to have an experience with the god Pan, operates on the patient's brain and consequently exposes her to being impregnated with the ancient god's demon child. Fear of science's intrusion on nature wasn't a feature of every gothic horror story, but it is common enough to be associated with the genre. These stories all have something in common that's going to contextualize gothic horror's importance from here on out, the world may be less mysterious as a result of science, but it is also more horrific. This background on the rational world, causing anxieties to show up as topics in the genre, is crucial to understanding gothic horror. And as we're going to see, it's crucial to fully understanding the story of Bloodborne as well. 
It's important to start this section by mentioning the fact that while Gothic horror writers weren't against science, there was something potentially unnerving about its application in even what were thought to be sacred places. Anything was subject to its methods. The awareness of this might be why in her story Frankenstein, Mary Shelley makes it sound perverted when one character states that scientists were to have, quote, penetrated into the recesses of nature and showed how she works in her hiding places. And using science to reveal the hidden is going to be of primary importance importance in Bloodborne. Because what's interesting about scientific empiricism, that is, observing information provided by the natural world, is it's primarily and fundamentally a visual method of understanding. And this matters because Bloodborne is extremely interested in what eyes have to offer, from witches covered in them, to pigs and spiders, to even the walls covered in them. Eyes are probably the most prominent symbol in the game that isn't already a symbol. Although Bloodborne is a world that's surrounded by secrets, it's no secret that this is a story obsessed with eyes. So I want to focus this next part of the discussion on Bergenworth, because considering the origins of gothic horror, the fact that it was a reaction to the potential horrors brought about by scientific discoveries in the hyper-rational world of the Enlightenment, it makes sense for Bergenworth to be the origin of these horrors in Bloodborne's world. Too. Because Bergenworth is a college, a symbol of objectively researching knowledge, and that is important to note as a symbol in itself but it's not nearly as important as the symbols we see in Bergenworth, a place where so much is about the visible, starting with the fact that the building is, or at least was, an observatory, complete with a telescope, a tool that's literally meant to enhance our vision so that we can see the things that are so far away that it would otherwise be impossible. But also, the rooms have, from what I can tell, the highest concentration of these eyeball-filled jars. It's also worth noting, this is where we find Willem, while he has covered his human eyes we recognize on his face, this was only done because of a greater appreciation for lining his brain with eyes, a perverted exaggeration of what knowledge the visual is able to obtain. And it's no coincidence that Willem drops the eye rune when he's killed, a rune literally used to boost discovery. What's important here isn't simply the frequent recurrence of eyes in themselves, but rather what they are linked to, because for Bergenworth, it's through our eyes that we were able to make discoveries and understand the truth. And this is what led to the discovery of the Great Ones. But what's most interesting about this idea of uncovering horrors through the visual is how the player actively engages in this. We can start with the most obvious, our insight counter that increases, not exclusively, but commonly, when characters make discoveries through his or her eyes. Further cementing the idea that this is a game intending to have players aware of the visible is our frenzy meter a mechanic that's directly linked to whether we are exposed to a visible path to horrors we cannot comprehend. But I think that's only half the picture. While this is a prime example of the game having us be aware of our relation to the visual space in this world, I don't think Bloodborne just wants us to be aware of what we're passively observing. Just as gothic horror was aware that scientists of the day were actively trying to understand and account for anomalies that manifested through the visual, this is also a practice that Bergenworth scholars and players are actively engaged in. In order to advance the game, we have to convince ourselves to jump into Moonside Lake by studying its visual anomalies. We can't rely on game prompts to interact with it like we do when we open other passages, and we don't figure out we can jump into it by being instructed to through the conceptual connections we make between areas we've learned about and abilities we've been granted through items. Instead, we can only look at it. So the concentration of fog, the seemingly never-ending ripples from an unknown source, and Willem's visual cue in this direction are all we have to work with when we decide to do the very thing that contradicts our instincts and jump. What we're doing here is observing something as unusual and comparing it to the unremarkable experiences we've had. In other words, we're engaging in the same scientific empiricism that helped fuel the gothic horror genre, but more importantly, the discoveries of Bergenworth. Another example is a less dramatic one, the entrance to the lore-heavy abandoned old workshop. It's a place that offers a huge amount of value in understanding the history of German and Yarnum itself, but it's obscured behind an entrance that can only be investigated after it's seen. And even then, there are substantial doubts that this investigation will pay off since it seems so hard to reach. I know for me, I was sure that this door wouldn't be interactable once I actually reached it. It seemed like the game wasn't designed for me to get down there. But because this was surrounded by windows, and this was the only door, it was so out of place, it begged to be further examined. I was exclusively trusting what was visible. So when it did open, it made for an experience that's tantamount to uncovering a secret room in an old house. This isn't a simple situation where we see something suspicious and realize it's blocked by a progress gate like we might see in some other games. 
These are things that once we know how to interact with, we view the item or ability that allows us access past that point as a simple key for those kinds of locks from then on. Instead of this, Bloodborne only offers these discoveries that reveal major plot elements through what's hidden in plain sight. The only way to extract more information from them though, is to be convinced that what you are investigating can yield more information. In other words, it has to look suspicious enough. And it only offers these kinds of anomalies that manifest through the visual, sparingly, so as to not make investigation a routine, but rather something that has the player questioning if they are wasting their time. In other words, we rarely see these anomalies, so as to not make this practice of empiricism perfunctory. This, for me at least, made finding these kinds of visual anomalies exciting, and I was eager to see what results they would yield. So like I said, Bloodborne is not a game that's simply concerned with what we are observing passively, and it's not solely concerned with what we gain through the conceptual, like we gain from lore descriptions and notes scattered throughout. Players gain some of the most important information by investigating the visible anomalies they physically see through the game space. And this wouldn't be gothic horror without monsters discovered through the intrusive methods granted by science. And that's why it matters when we find one of the most important discoveries in the game turns out to be the ancient horror that is the amygdalas. It's not something that's clearly presented to us through a cutscene or just entering Yahar Ghul for the first time. Instead, we discover these horrors through gameplay. When we first interact with them, they come in the form of this slowly drifting purple miasma that wafts towards us inexplicably. The rest of their form is invisible, but the purple cloud manifesting into this world in a ghost-like way is all we need to know that something is strange. If we are curious enough, like I was when I first saw it, we can poke and prod at it so as to reveal as much information as we can. This included me putting my own body at risk so as to reveal more information from the anomaly by entering into the mist myself. This allows us to see not the full creature, but its outline. It was something I knew was strange on its own, but I naively believed I was entitled to discover what kind of creature it actually was by the end of the game. But as we all likely agree, it's after we defeat Rom and the amygdalas are revealed that the real horrors of Bloodborne unfold. Just as Dr. Frankenstein was aware he had crossed an unknown line and had intruded on nature's secrets only after he had rested his eyes on his creation when it came to life through that infamous spark of being, so too did I not realize I had crossed a line until my eyes had rested on these giant horrors that dramatically changed my understanding of the game. And all of this matters because if players felt the same way I did, where there was a rush of excitement when they saw something strange that occurred through the visual, they were acting in that famous spirit of Bergenworth. Because just like the eye rune says, eyes symbolize truth. This means what we discover from the visual is so important to understanding the world, it causes us to take risks and even test on ourselves like the mad scientist Dr. Jekyll was driven to. In other words, we are engaging in the same kind of scientific empiricism many gothic horror writers were leery of because of its intrusiveness. The importance of being acutely aware of the visual is something that's cemented by the fact that, excluding the chalice dungeons, there are no illusionary walls like you'd see, or maybe not, in Dark Souls. Illusionary walls are, by definition, obstacles that are aided by your vision because they appear to be completely insignificant on their own. In other words, a good illusion is one that has you trust the information your vision is providing. In that sense, if we have reason to suspect a wall is an illusion, what we see has to be distrusted as a red herring, and we instead rely on other intuitions. For me, most illusionary walls were solved because I read a message from another player, or even sometimes on a meta level. I think there simply has to be more to an area from a design standpoint than what I found. Because Dark Souls games use these so much, and Bloodborne's designed levels don't use them at all, this seems like a very deliberate choice that's meant for the narrative. For Bloodborne, the visual cannot be something that leads us astray. Instead, Bloodborne's design levels replace them with breakable walls that make sense contextually. Like when we see a window and think to try to break it because it makes sense that it would break on impact. All of this stacks up to support the idea. Bloodborne isn't only a game that's interested in how powerful the observable is. It's interested in having players engaging in scientific empiricism to uncover its horrors that lie dormant until they are revealed. By having players interact with the game in this way, they become a mad scientist in their own right. And this fear, created from our own thirst for understanding the natural world, is going to support one of the game's most persistent and important themes.
It's important to recognize gothic horror in this game is more than just a mosaic of monsters that almost feels like a greatest hits of the gothic horror genre. I think it's fair to say these themes of discovering information about the natural world only to discover horrors were indeed a large component of Lovecraft stories too. But like I said, Lovecraft was a product of the genre, and I think to him, science hadn't yet uncovered the secret that would unsettle mankind from their belief that they are meant to dominate the universe. This is, after all, a statement he made directly in the opening of The Call of Cthulhu. But science wasn't new and creeping atop the ground long established by religion at a decades at a time pace in his time like it was when gothic horror began. For Lovecraft, science would uncover the horrors of our future, for gothic horror writers, it was uncovering horrors in their present. And there's one in particular that's central to the story of Bloodborne that's still relevant today. It's not a criticism of science, and it's not just the idea that scientific empiricism will lead to the discovery of horrors. It's that we are engaged in the conflict between man and beast, where man is the rational being and the beast is driven by baser instinct. The idea that the pursuit of truth is the most noble goal we can dedicate our lives to is the rational side, attempting to have our actions be consistent with our ideals. It's something I was engaged in in my multiple playthroughs of Bloodborne, and something that made Willem himself relatable. And I didn't just use the tools of the rational world to accomplish this goal. I was excited for the opportunity to do so. But as we know, there's a deep visceral reaction when we finally unearth these discoveries. It's in these moments that we don't just see the enlightened creature as at odds with the bestial creature, we feel it. So that conflict within myself where I had to overcome those visceral reactions I was enduring in pursuit of knowledge isn't a theme that's primarily communicated through notes like we see directly outlining here, not through cutscenes like we see here, and not through connecting lore points. While it's supported by those things, this theme where we are at odds with the beast within ourselves is primarily communicated through gameplay. Like I said in the beginning of this video, games being able to communicate their themes through gameplay is the potent and unique attribute of the medium. And just like scientists did for society in the days of gothic horror, with each discovery I made in pursuit of my idealism of understanding this world, I, not my character, was able to erode a little more from the naive presumption that I will be able to conquer this world after I discover its secrets. And that's what's important here, I was actively uncovering these horrors through my genuine curiosity that the game was so good about provoking and allowing me to further explore. And before I knew it, I had crossed a line. This was the essence of the most famous gothic horror stories. The world is now less mysterious, but it is also more horrific. So as much as I believed I would tame Bloodborne's world by understanding it, its secrets didn't only reveal horrors in the game world, it revealed the horror within myself. An unsettled creature, provoked by our rational side, lying in wait within all of us. Thank you for watching. I apologize for how long this took. I've got excuses, but do you really want to hear them? A huge thank you to all my patient patrons for being so generous with how much slack they allow me. I'd also like to thank Grant Vogel, Elroyd, Max Mills, Rainbow Hawk 1993, Dan Stumpf, Shane Levengood, Attila, James Burgett, Abit Bakistanli, Gianluca Romeo, Thomas Greenberg, David Sternberg, KD, Furious George, Jack Panette, Lupus Yonderboy, Ashley Dawkins, Ben Jones, Joshua Herman, and Rita Wallstrom. If you'd like to join this awesome group of people whom I'm extremely appreciative of for helping to fund this dolphin's endeavors, you can become a patron at the link provided below. Thanks again, and I'll see you guys next time.